Dr. Peter Kreeft is a professor of philosophy at Boston College. He loves his five grandchildren, four children, one wife, one cat, and one god. He has written over 100 books, including the Handbook of Christian Apologetics, Christianity for Modern Pagans, Fundamentals of the Faith, and most recently, How to Destroy Western Civilization and Other Ideas from the Cultural Abyss. He is known at BC for his courses on Tolkien, C.S. Lewis, and philosophy of world religions, and is a highly sought after as a professor. And he's speaking today about C.S. Lewis, the human soul, and technology. Professor Crave, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Tom. I like it when people assign me a topic. That's doing half my work for me, because the topic is really the question, and the talk, or the book, uh, is the answer. And this is why I never assign topics to students. I recommend extra credit essays, and they say, give us topics to write on. And I say, no, that would be theft. Half your intellectual work is getting the question out, really getting it out, like getting a baby out. Uh, it takes effort. Think through a question. Uh, much harder than you think. Finding answers is easy, too easy. Too many easy answers around us are too confusing. So uh, thank you for doing the hard half of my work for me. Um, the title I was assigned was C.S. Lewis, Technology and Human Flourishing. Those are three topics, uh, three themes, sort of like the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe, which are the three most important entities in the first Chronicles of Narnia. Of the three themes, the first one, C.S. Lewis, is relative to the other two. You want to know what C.S. Lewis has to say that is worthwhile and wise about other two topics. And concerning the other two topics, uh, technology and human flourishing, uh, technology is obviously, uh, can be, an instrument for the end of human flourishing. So that's the most important topic, human flourishing, which is the word that is often used today for happiness, because almost all the great philosophers ask the question, what is happiness? And almost all of them say that, in one sense, happiness is the ultimate end, that for which we do everything else. Nobody says, I want to be happy so that I can play golf. Some people say I play golf because it makes me happy. Some people say I don't do it because it doesn't make me happy. So happiness is the end. But it has to be defined. And there's a very important difference between the way we use the word happiness and the word, uh, the way ancient Greeks like Aristotle did. Uh, and because of that difference, the word flourishing is a better word than the word happiness. Let's take happiness first. It contains the old English word hap, which if you know Elizabethan English means chance or luck. Uh, and that's a rather shallow notion of happiness. And most of us are rather shallow most of the time. If your best friend suddenly appears with a great big smile on his face, what's your natural reaction? Hey, what happened to you? Did you just win the lottery? We think that uh, games of chance are the first thing we think about when we think of happiness. But that's not the first thing the ancients and medievals thought about when they thought of happiness. The word eudaimonia, the word that Aristotle uses, and Aristotle thinks that the question of human happiness and how to attain it is the most important question in ethics. We don't usually think of happiness concerning ethics. We may think that ethics has some rules for how you do and don't go about getting happiness. But happiness is really a, 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 the fundamental ethical issue. You know, Lewis says in Mere Christianity that uh, uh, human life is like uh, a fleet of sailing ships uh, sailing together on the sea. Uh, and they need um, three pieces of advice, three uh, wisdoms from their sailing orders. And two of them are obviously ethical, but the third one, which we usually neglect, is the most ethical of all. We don't usually think of this third thing as being ethical. First thing is uh, social justice, how to cooperate, how to help the other ships, how not to get in their way, but to aid them so that we can have uh, some sort of common good. All right, important. Even more important is that each ship stays ship shape and float. The sunken ship can't help anybody. But most important of all, is the question of what is the mission of the fleet? What's the, uh, the goal of, of activity, individual and collective? 
you don't know whether you're supposed to be fighting a war or uh, taking passengers on a, a pleasure cruise or ferrying cargo uh, or ferrying passengers to an island. Uh, you, you won't get there. And that's the question of what is the greatest good? What is the ultimate end of everything that we do? And most of the ancients, Plato, Aristotle, Augustine, Aquinas, uh, say that it is happiness. Because what they mean by happiness, eudaimonia, is not what we mean by happiness. It's not simply something that happens to you by chance. Look at that Greek word. It starts with two letters, EU, which means good. So that assumes that you can't be happy unless you're good. And then the middle part of the word, daimon, D-A-I-M-O-N, means spirit. Uh, we get the word demon from it, which means an evil spirit, but daimon doesn't necessarily mean an evil spirit. It just simply means a spirit or a soul. So happiness is not primarily a material thing, uh, but a spiritual thing, state of soul. And finally, the last two letters, ia, turn a verb into a noun. So eudaimonia indicates a a real objective state of soul, not just a subject of feeling. So it's deeper than feelings. And it's a state that lasts, it's not just temporary. That's a much deeper notion of happiness than, than power. So the word flourishing is better than that because when a, an animal or a plant or a human being flourishes, it attains its end, its greatest good, its summum bonum. The assumption of that word and that implicit notion of happiness is that the following four things are all objective truths, whereas the contrary assumption, I think, that they are not objective truths, but subjective feelings, dominates our culture. The first thing is truth itself. Is truth something that we construct? We invent it. Is life more like art or more like science? Do we discover or do we create? Well, we do both. But uh, unless we first discover the truth, especially the truth about ourselves and our happiness, we create the wrong things. So we begin with the assumption of, of objective truth. Secondly, it assumes that human nature is an objective thing, not a human construct. It assumes that uh, a human being cannot, simply by wanting to be, uh, become an angel uh, or an animal. You can act like one to act like one to succeed. That also implicitly assumes that uh, what you are by nature, your human nature has given to you, is what you really are. And if you uh, don't know that, you're wrong. For instance, it assumes the idea, which today is uh, increasingly radical in progressive circles, was regarded as self-evident by almost everybody in the world, in all cultures, times, places, religions, in human history, Namely, if you're a boy, you can't be a girl. And if you're a girl, you can't be a boy, or only pretend to be. Uh, we're not allowed to do that anymore. If we use the wrong pronouns, we get fired. We're living in a very, very strange world. A third thing that is objective, that is assumed in this notion of happiness or human flourishing, is purpose, or end, or goal, or teleology from Elos means end. Aristotle, like common sense, assumed that everything is moving uh, towards its own proper end. Uh, puppies become dogs, not cats, and kittens become cats, not puppies, and fire moves up and not down, and heavy objects fall down and not up. In other words, uh, causality is not just a push. Everything by nature seeks its fulfillment, its flourishing. Plants grow. Horns turn into oak trees. Bees turn into adult human beings. Teleology. Uh, the reason that's uh, an unpopular idea today uh, in popular culture and among most philosophers is that it's implicitly religious. Uh, purposes don't just uh, happen like clouds. Uh, they exist in minds and wills. And if there is a purpose to everything in the universe, including human life itself, there is a cosmic design, there must be a cosmic designer. So that's probably the most pervasive and instinctive argument for the existence of something like God. Of course, uh, uh, correct proxy today. If you want to believe that 
really superstition privately, we'll tolerate you, but we're certainly not going to let you say it in public. Uh, finally, uh, the fourth thing that the notion of happiness as an objective end assumes is that values or laws or uh, commands that tell you how to get to this end and what to do to get to it, these two are objective. This is what C.S. Lewis in his prophetic little book, The Abolition of Man, calls the Tao, the Chinese word. It means something very similar to uh, the uh, Greek word logos. Those are probably the two profoundest in any human language. They have many layered meanings. But the core meaning is this is the good. This is what distinguishes good and evil. That which is in accordance with the good, that which is in accordance with the right way, the Tao, objective value. The single sentence that I think most sharply distinguishes the reigning philosophy in our modern Western culture from every other culture in the entire history of the world that has ever existed is this sentence from the abolition of man. Lewis says, to our ancestors, the cardinal problem of human life, is how to conform the human soul to objective reality. And the answers included wisdom, self-discipline and virtue. To the modern mind, the cardinal problem of human life is how to subdue objective reality to the wishes of man. And the answer is a technique. Technique, gimmick, a way, a means. Technology. The single most important thing in our entire society is technology. Technology has changed our life and our philosophy more than anything else has. Now, I am not a Luddite. I do not think that technology is intrinsically evil. Third, uh, there's a lot of good technology in the Bible, Bazaar, for instance and a lot of bad technology. Cain's rock, which was the first weapon. Uh, but the ancients, Plato, Aristotle, Augustine, Aquinas, all thought that technology was only the third most important thing. The first and most important thing is to know the truth. And then secondly, to live it, conform to it. And then to change the world around you. Uh, in accordance with um, truth and goodness. Uh, Aristotle said there's three purposes of human knowledge. One is simply truth. You want to know the truth because that's an absolute. You just want to know whether you can use it or not. Secondly, to use it uh, for living, to uh, know right moral values and to live them. Thirdly, to use it for remaking the world around you so that it's more comfortable and more useful and more beautiful, whether this is uh, fine art, whose end is beauty, or practical art, whose end is utility, uh, it's the third thing, not the first thing. Francis Bacon announces this new greatest good, this new greatest uh, end of human life, uh, by saying that uh, the ancients were like little children. They were simply curious. They wanted to know, what's that, what's that? wanted to make a map of reality. They were contemplatives. Like Aristotle, they put the contemplation of truth at the top. But we moderns have, uh, have come of age, and we realize that changing the world uh, is the most important thing in the world. We are, we are homo faber, man the maker, homo sapiens, and the, the why. That is a radically new answer to the question, what is the single most important thing in human life? Well, technology is simply the application of knowledge to uh, acting on the world. Uh, technology is uh, an off of science. You can't do technology uh, effectively unless you for science. So, this first end of knowledge, namely knowing the truth, is a necessary preliminary to technology. But for Bacon, it's only a means, and technology is the end. Lewis points out that around the time of the Renaissance, both technology and magic became very popular. Uh, 
magic was not popular in the Middle Ages. Most people believed it was possible. It was forbidden. It was feared, not usually practiced. Technology was not feared. Technology is obviously a good thing in itself and, and human and helps us in many, many ways. But uh, the Middle Ages weren't very good at technology because they didn't really have the scientific method of roping their way towards it. Uh, so the technology that they had was rel relatively primitive. Uh, around the time of the Renaissance uh, and Bacon's new summum bonum, uh, there was a great interest in magic, the occult, in alchemy, in uh, astrology, in trying to control the cosmos, and it didn't work. Around the same time, you have the rise of technology. Most people think that technology is, is modern and magic is medieval. No. You have very little of both in the Middle Ages. You suddenly have both of them flourishing around the time of the Renaissance, especially the, the later scientific Renaissance. Because although magic and technology are very different, in that magic is supernatural and technology is not, nevertheless, they have the same goal, the Baconian goal. If you could do magic, you wouldn't need technology. If you could uh, go from one place to another or clean the house simply by uh, uh, snapping your fingers and let it be done, you wouldn't need uh, uh, machines. But magic didn't work. Technology did. Therefore, uh, magic rightly died out and flourished. But the goal was the same. The means is different. And the dimensions are supernatural versus natural. The most important thing is what your heart is set on, love, the means. So this love of power and the conquest of nature becomes the, uh, the new defining feature of modern Western civilization. And it's certainly the thing that we're most spectacularly successful at. It's our strong suit. We're, we're like a, a pitcher who has only a fastball, but it has a 110 mile an hour fastball. Uh, we're certainly not happier in the, in the even in the modern sense of, of content and satisfied. And we're certainly not more virtuous. We're certainly not more holy, uh, but we are more powerful, incredibly more powerful. And that increase in power without an increase in wisdom and holiness and virtue is a really dangerous thing. To quote Lewis one more time, there is a very simple little essay called First and Second Things that I highly recommend. Lewis is, is as great an essay as he is a, a writer of complete books. Uh, during World War II, he noticed that uh, the Nazis had officially changed their mythology. They thought of it as their, their Bible. Uh, and in, uh, uh, in the Nibelungenlied, the great German uh, myth, uh, Siegfried is the hero, and Hagen, uh, the uh, dark little dwarf, is a kind of a semi-villain. Well, they officially announced that Hagen is now the hero because Hagen resembled Adolf Hitler. And Lewis said, aha, I thought that would happen. Because when you subordinate a first thing to a second, when you undo the hierarchy of values, and you worship a second thing as if it were God, your first thing. Not only do you lose the first thing, but you spoil the second thing. Now, According to Lewis and according to tradition, art is more noble than politics. Politics is a, um, a blend of, uh, at least in the ancient mind, uh, social ethics and uh, the art of the possible, a kind of uh, collective human technology. Uh, and so it's a means to an end. Art, however, uh, seeks beauty, which is an end in itself, whether art itself is is don't say. Beauty certainly is. Uh, beauty is one of the three things every human mind wants and wants without limit all the time, the other being the good and the true. So when you subordinate this higher thing, beauty, to this lower thing, politics, not only do you mess up the higher thing, you really mess up the lower thing. Like us, although in a different direction, we absolutized politics. They were passionately religious about their politics. But they were totally political about their religion. Now, 
were Nazis, but most people in our society are making exactly that same mistake, only with different content. I think this is one of the reasons why ordinary people instinctively see The Lord of the Rings as the greatest book of the 20th century. Four different polls came up with that conclusion, and the critics couldn't believe it. The critics are apparently the only people in the world who don't love the Lord of the Rings. One of them uh, said, uh, why have we taught these people to read if they're going to read juvenile trash? And yet, uh, here is uh, the greatest book of the 20th century, according to the rest of the world. Why? Because central to that is us. Uh, instinctively, we are suspicious of our technological success, of our, our strongest suit, of our, of our fastball. We're afraid of it. The obvious example is nuclear bombs. If we could undo that little bit of knowledge so that we couldn't make nuclear bombs anymore, wouldn't the world be much safer? Of course, but we can't. We can't put that genie back in the bottle. And Sauron's ring of power is unlimited. You have to grow into it, but uh, there's no limit to it. It's, it's the conquest of nature uh, exponentially. Uh, and it is the fulfillment of Bacon philosophy. The ultimate goal is not uh, God's conquest of man, but man's conquest of nature. And you find that not just in Bacon, you find that in Descartes as well. Descartes, the uh, uh, apparently quite traditional uh, philosopher, uh, uh, a rationalist, not a uh, and yet uh, book six of the Discourse and Method is all about the power of technology to conquer everything in nature, even old age and disease, and perhaps death itself. In fact, the most progressive among us, the so-called transhumanists, especially in Silicon Valley, are working seriously, on the conquest of death by genetic engineering, supreme technology. Uh, about half of the scientists say that's intrinsically impossible, it can never happen, but the other half say, uh, yes, it can happen. Because um, uh, very simple organisms like amoebas uh, are not programmed to get old or die. They die only when accidents happen. And if we could imitate that little genetic programming, which says thou shalt never get old or die, uh, and insert it into the human chromosome, where right now is inserted thou shalt get old and die, you would, in theory, have a human being that would to be just like us in every way, and it would uh, mature, and then it would just never die. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Wouldn't that be the total conquest of nature? Well, if you want to see what that kind of world would be, uh, I suggest a little experiment. Take a dozen eggs, put them on the kitchen table, and leave them there for a year, untouched, and then come back and smell. To quote C.S. Lewis again, you're like eggs at present. You can't just go on being a good egg forever. You have to hatch or go bad, and death is hatching. Lewis argues in The Abolition of Man that uh, to idolize technology, make man's conquest of nature the supreme good, and to demote the Tao, the actual moral law, objective value, to a means to that end, to deny that there is an authoritative and universally binding Tao uh, governing both the controllers and the controlled in every possible society, to deny that, to say that we create our own values, our own laws. Life is like a game. And if you want to play baseball, you play baseball. If you want to play football, you play football. And that's largely the modern world. Well, in that modern context of moral subjectivism and moral relativism, uh, man's conquest of nature really becomes nature's conquest of man. Well, because, first of all, uh, the Tao is supernatural. It guides you. You deny it, nature rules. You. And when you have this power, 
you're going to exercise it not simply over nature, but over other people. You may exercise it slowly. Take a very simple thing, money. Money is a means of exchange. It uh, is like the oil that greases the pistons in uh, the motor of your car and makes it move uh, more efficiently. Uh, but if it conquers you, it's not your slave, it's your master. Uh, and those who have a lot of it can oppress uh, those who have a little of it. They don't have to, but they can. Take another example, airplanes. It gives us a power over space and time. We can get uh, from the East Coast to the West Coast in five hours instead of 80 days. Fine. Uh, and we make a contract with the, uh, the airline company. They make the money, we give them the money, and they give us the service. Here's a couple hundred dollars, take me from New York to San Francisco. And it works, and both sides are happy. But notice that the passengers are controlled, and the plane and the pilot and the airline company are the ones that are doing the control. So what seems like man's conquest over nature is really uh, man's conquest over other people using nature and technology as an instrument. Another example is contraception. You control the existence of people by technology. How many people do you want? This many, all right? So whoever is using the contraceptive is uh, in control and whoever is the object of contraception to allow birth or not to allow birth is the one who's being controlled. Uh, another example is what we're using right now, technology of communications. I'm in control here, I'm speaking. You're being controlled. You're listening to my ideas. You're being influenced by my ideas. Of course, you're free to say they're nonsense if you like, uh, or you're free to say they are divine revelation if you like, or you're free to be reasonable and say, let's uh, think about this. Uh, what seemed to be man's conquest of nature is always, in every example, man's use of nature as technologized as an instrument for controlling other people. Which is fine if we all have the same values. If we don't, if values are subjective inventions, if the Tao is a fiction, then man's conquest of nature comes. Nature's conquest of man. So what do we do about it? Somehow we all feel that technology has made us weaker. Isn't that strange? It seems to have made us stronger. We've got more power over nature than ever before. And yet the individual feels lost. Our ancestors felt stronger than we do. They felt more in control of their lives than we do. We complain. Uh, life is so complicated. Life is, is, is hectic. We're harried and hassled. Uh, we have no time. Time is the most pervasive dimension of life. It, it pervades our, our spiritual life, our thought, as well as our physical life, our bodies. So if we truly conquered nature, we've conquered time, which means that time is not a tyrant but a servant, all right? If we've conquered time, uh, where is all the time gone? Nobody has enough time anymore. The more technology we have, the less time we have. And yet every technological invention is in some sense a time-saving device. Isn't that strange? The very thing that was designed to give us more time seems to have stolen time. Hmm. Same is true about power. We feel individually more powerless than our ancestors did, even though collectively, through our technology, we have more power over nature than ever before. Something has gone wrong here. I'm going to tell you a, a, a little story, true story, um, that, to my mind, casts some light on answering that question. Well, just a little late clue. It's not a direct and logical answer to what went wrong and what can we do about it, but indirectly. 
got a phone call back in the 80s from a very famous writer. Uh, I had only written a few books at the time. I was not well known at all. I'm very flattered looked me up. Uh, and he was one of the pioneers of the computer revolution. Forget his name. I think it was an Eastern European name. He had just written a book that the New York Times had called one of the, tw uh, that made him one of the 12 most intelligent men in the universe. Uh, and uh, he found a sentence in one of my books that uh, expressed reservations about computer technology. And the reservations were due mainly to the fact that I'm an absolute idiot about computers. Uh, I'm, I think I'm a pretty good writer and a pretty good teacher, but certainly not the best one in the world. But I think I am the very best person in the world uh, about one thing, how to goof up computers, how to make them my enemies, how to conquer by them instead of conquering them. Uh, and so I was just complaining. He thought I was more serious than that. He thought I was a kind of Luddite. And I think he was too. He said, this is very dangerous. This uh, thing that has so much power uh, has a feedback effect on us. Uh, we are being turned into our instruments. Uh, and evidence for that fact gave me two pieces of evidence, since uh, my suspicion, uh, and said, uh, well, uh, you know, the brain has two hemispheres. This is a bit of an oversimplification, but it's not wholly wrong. And uh, one half works like a computer, the left half that does analysis, and the other half doesn't. It's more intuitive, more feeling oriented, and it gives you the big picture, and that's the right hemisphere. And the two hemispheres are meant to both function and to cooperate. But computers are like only uh, a in one hemisphere. And he says that uh, since we're using computers more and more and becoming more like them, so we will be unable to perform the operations that our ancestors would do. For instance, analogies. Uh, digital computers cannot understand analogies. Their language is mathematics, and mathematics is totally univocal and literal and not at all analogical. So he said, uh, get out your old logic uh, tests uh, from 20 or 30 years ago when you first started teaching. And they were articulating logic, and they focused on uh, things like defining terms and finding out whether terms were used univocally with only one meaning, Quizzically with two misleading meanings, or analogically with a useful range of meanings somewhere between the univocal and the equivocal. And the old SAT tests that everyone could get into good colleges uh, had uh, in its verbal aptitude test, 25% of the stuff was about analogies. He said, I, I predict that no one will be able to pass that part of the test in another 10 years. Even Harvard students who get 100 on the rest of the test will flunk that part. So they'll have to omit it altogether. Okay. That sounds rather radical. Uh, so I uh, put the phone down and uh, just took that in the back of my brain. And a couple of months later, uh, I read in the newspaper that what he predicted had come to pass. The SAT people had dropped all analogies from their test because nobody could pass them anymore, even the brightest students. So I got out my old tests. And I gave my current logic student uh, the test on analogy that I had given 20 years ago, and most of them flunked. I think he was right. That's a principle uh, that's often called the master slave relationship. Uh, the master becomes enslaved to its slave. Apparently, the master has the power and the slave doesn't. Really, what's going on is exactly the opposite. The slave is more powerful than the master because the opposite of freedom and power is addiction. And the slave master is addicted to his need for the slave. Slaves are not addicted to the master at all. They're free, literally. Hmm. I heard recently, I don't know if this is still true, that uh, the little startup Catholic college called Wyoming Catholic College, uh, which I've heard very good things about, uh, does not allow cell phones on campus for all four years. And many students say, I can't go there. Uh, I can't live without my cell phone. That's what most of my students say. When I suggest to them that they uh, try a little experiment and um, 
uh, look at no screen, no computer, no cell phone, no TV even for 24 hours. See how your life was different during those 24 hours, how you related to other people in the world differently. Uh, they often say, yeah, I'll try it. So far, about 50% of them have said the same thing. I thought I could live without my cell phone for 24 hours. I can't. Identity. For all of them, it was a tremendous struggle, like the struggle to get over dependence on, on a drug or a chemical. So I think the first thing we have to do uh, is not to throw away all the technology that's absurd, or even to throw away the cell phone that's absurd, but to cultivate a kind of detect, even while we're using the things. How can you both be detached from and properly accept and use the same thing at the same time? Well, ask the saints. They're not talking so much about technology. They're talking about the whole world. Here, God gave us an entire universe. It's not heaven, but it's good, and it's useful, and it's a road to heaven, or it can be a road to hell. And if we forget the principle of first and second things and worship it as if it is our God, it will become our road to hell. And if we use it properly and say it is simply a means to a higher end, it becomes a road to heaven. That's using properly the principle of first and second things. If we do the opposite, well, then since we're not released from and detached from our need for the world or technological control of the world, it will become our master. Just like Sauron's brain becomes the master of anybody who overuses it. So, detachment, inner detachment. But you can't be detached from A unless you're detached towards B. If I say, do not think of a blue crocodile, think of a blue crocodile. But if I say, think instead of a red fire-breathing dragon, that red fire-breathing dragon will be so big that it'll throw out the blue crocodile. So the second part of my answer, after detachment from our addiction to the things, not just of nature, but more consistently, the, uh, uh, the power of our technology to control me. After our detachment from that, attachment to God, the practice of the presence of God. Uh, it's against our fallen nature. We have to struggle to do it. But the more you do it, the more you develop the muscle and the more you're able to do it. Without detachment from our power and without attachment to God as our supreme good, we're not going to go anywhere. We're going to continue to go down inside that black hole. And I'm optimistic enough to think that human nature uh, is wise enough deep down to learn from our mistakes. Uh, human nature was not designed at Harvard or Hollywood or in heaven. It was designed to get there. I'm going to give myself the hook now and uh, ask for questions. Uh, that's the fun part. I thank you for listening so patiently uh, to my monologue, which is intrinsically not as interesting as a dialogue. And the dialogue is happening now, it's going to begin to happen very soon. Uh, your questions, my answers, and maybe vice versa. Uh, after you, if, if, if you're at the mic, after you ask a question, hang around for a minute because I might have a question about your question. You might engage it in that dialogue. Thank you, Dr. Kreet. Uh, Nick McAfee, University of Dallas. Um, I was found it a breath of fresh air that you ended with the practice of the presence of God. Uh, I almost want to say I was surprised by a sort of prayerful or spiritual answer, uh, just because it's my, my experience that events like this, um, one of the most helpful uh, antidotes, uh, spirituality and prayer seems to be uh, oftentimes sort of bracketed to the side. And, and perhaps that's Again, this is my hypothesis. I think a lot of people broadly on the, the right uh, of center political spectrum, we, we sort of assume that there are natural lawyers kind of in the background somewhere uh, doing the sort of objective morality hard work. And, and well, maybe we're sort of largely Christian. Um, but I, I wonder, um, you know, I, I sort of appreciated that that ending to your talk. Am I correct in, in assuming that um, 
that that is a, a missing like like the practice of the presence of God and and concrete approaches to to spiritual discipline are largely absent from sort of broad uh, forums in which we discuss uh, dealing with technology, especially you know in a political way. Um, is that a, an absence? And uh, how how would you recommend, if so, going about um, you know the immediate sort of opposition that I can instinctively think of to talking about prayer, uh, for example, or the nuts and bolts of prayer uh, in this kind of a forum, which is, look, uh, we probably don't all share the same uh, perspective on prayer or the nature of God and, and so forth. So I'm wondering, how do we navigate uh, in conversations about technology, having a meaningful contribution from, from that perspective of, of prayer? Well, how you do it is relative and there are many answers to that question and all the saints say that's not the most important question uh, if you're a hindu the yoga that you practice determines everything and there's different kinds of yogas for different kinds of people but if you're a jew or a christian or a muslim the yoga or method is secondary because there's no spiritual technology prayer is basically love you attach yourself to God. You, you, you look at God and fall in love with him and let his light shine over every part of your life. Uh, and there's no button pushing for that. But unless you do that, you're going to go insane, literally. I mean, to, uh, to say that God and the difference God makes and the presence of God is irrelevant to life is like saying that Shakespeare is irrelevant to Macbeth. Uh, if, if, if God doesn't exist, then all who put him at the center of their lives are as stupid as an adult who's still making the invisible childhood friend that they invented at the age of three into the most important person of their lives. Like, like Jimmy Stewart in that old movie, Harvey. Harvey is a, uh, an enormous invisible rabbit that nobody can see except Jimmy Stewart. In every other way he seems sane, but he's nuts. On the other hand, if God does exist, then atheists are nuts because they're like kids who go home for Thanksgiving and don't acknowledge the existence of their parents and don't acknowledge the fact that their parents are the ones who fed them and, and gave them money to go to college. And they go home for Christmas and uh, they, uh, uh, they don't thank their parents for the, uh, the gifts and they, don't, they look right through them as if they're not there, as if they're ghosts. So if God is anywhere, he's everywhere. So that's, that's an absolute either or. Now you can do that explicitly, you can do that implicitly. Uh, many a person who thinks he's uh, an agnostic and is very suspicious of religion may be in fact practicing God's presence, the presence of at least that which God is, the good and the true and the beautiful, more effectively than a, a conscious believer uh, who would answer a poll about religion uh, in a perfectly orthodox way, but it doesn't or make a difference to their life. So I don't think this is something that necessarily shows up on polls, but I think it does show up in places like the, uh, the psychiatric ward. Hi, Dr. Grave. Uh, Charlie Cannell from the University of Dallas here. Um, thanks for your talk. I had a question that we were discussing at this table about certain technologies that might be a little bit beyond the pale um, in that their, their ends are so wicked that we can't make proper use of them oriented mm -hmm. towards the ultimate good. You mentioned nuclear weapons, which yep. you also said is something you can't really put back in the bottle, um, which I think is true. Um, but from a Catholic perspective, there's also the matter of uh, contraception, which you also mentioned, or, or abortive drugs. Um, so it's just curious if you had any thoughts. Are there any technologies um, where their removal or their destruction or their reversal is the only proper answer? Well, if you can't put the genie back into the bottle, you can't reverse time. You can just refuse to use it, which the world has so far successfully done for almost a century, uh, at least with regard to nuclear bombs. Uh, you got to be careful here to, to distinguish the immediate and the proximate. Uh, the purpose of a nuclear bomb as distinct from nuclear power is to kill. Uh, 
And the purpose of uh, an abortion is to kill. The instruments that are used to make nuclear energy and the instruments that can be used for abortion, but can also be used for other things, like a scalpel or forceps, are not intrinsically evil. Uh, and the, the, the end is not just your personal motive, which you add to the situation. The end is objective, it's in the situation itself. So whenever you see something that is that can't be used for good, the only thing you can do with it if you don't destroy it is just turn your back on it and refuse it all the time. Uh, that, those things are very rare. There are things that are very dangerous. Fire, for instance, uh, or the power of social media. But if something is very dangerous and able to be used for great evil, it's also able to be used for great good. There's an old saying, uh, corruptio optimi pessima. The corruption of the best things is the worst thing. And a corollary of that is when you find one of these worst things, always look for a best thing that it was corrupt. Take, for instance, the, the passion of a Nazi uh, turned in a horribly wrong direction uh, and resulting in one of the greatest horrors, if not the greatest horror in the history of the world, the Holocaust. But imagine you had that passion, uh, the passion of a Hitler devoted to God. Many of the saints were made out of great sinners. You know, St. Paul was a, a really nasty sort. He got his jollies out of persecuting Christians. And, um, and Augustine was the playboy of the Western world. And Ignatius Loyola was a mercenary soldier. Uh, Take, take that passion and turn it around for good, and you've got a saint. My name is Corey Gunter, also from the University of Dallas, so three for three. Um, my question is about magic. Uh, you mentioned the connection between technology and magic, and I just found that fascinating. I was wondering if you could maybe expand on that a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Psychologists sometimes use this little experiment to find out whether little kids are going to think like structuralists or functionalists. Structuralists look at the form or the essential nature of a thing. Functionalists look at the practical use of a thing. Uh, so they'll, uh, they'll give them four, four toys, a baseball, a baseball bat, uh, a basketball, and a backboard, and say, uh, put your toys away in these two cartons. Structuralists will put the two balls in one carton and the two non-balls in the other carton. Functionalists will put the baseball and the bat in one carton uh, and the backboard and the basketball in another card. All right. So let's play that game with four human enterprises. Magic, uh, religion, technology, and theoretical science. Most people would put theoretical science together and magic and religion together. Magic and religion both deal with the supernatural and theoretical science and technology don't. There's nothing wrong with that classification, but it's at least equally correct to put magic and technology together as serving the end of power, control over nature, and to put theoretical science and religion together as serving the opposite end, namely conforming to the real nature of things, both supernatural by religion and natural by science. Hi, uh, I'm Robert from the University of Science and Arts of Oklahoma. Uh, my question is kind of similar to the second to last one that was asked, but I suppose I'll set it forward anyway. Uh, you talk about technology and its ability to be used either as a, kind of a road to heaven or a road to hell. And uh, I'm just wondering, given humans' sin nature, if that is taken for granted, isn't it the case that technology will be used as a road to hell far more often than it will be used as a road to heaven? And if, if so, can technology at the macro level be used for good for society to do, do more good than ill, I suppose. I don't see the necessity of uh, that judgment. Why, why must it be more used for evil than for good? Uh, if you're a Calvinist, yes, you believe in total depravity. But if you're a Catholic, you believe that, that nature and grace are natural cooperators not natural enemies, and that we're fallen, yes, and that our fall is total in the sense that it pervades every aspect of our life, but we're certainly not fallen as far as we could be. And Thomas Aquinas goes so far as to say in the Summa, uh, and here I think he's disagreeing with C.S. Lewis. I think, I'm not sure, but I think that if, if 
Aquinas read C.S. Lewis, he'd say, great, great, great. But then the abolition of man seems to say that this fall is inevitable uh, and, and irreversible. Uh, Aquinas says, can the natural law ever be totally abolished from the heart of man? The answer is no. So at least, at least there's a, uh, you can't rip up your moral motherboard. You can't destroy your, your knowledge of, of the truth. You can suppress it. And here I use a, a, a little bit from Freudian psychology. Uh, Paul says in Romans 1 that uh, uh, pagans uh, are suppressing their knowledge of the truth. They're not simply forgetting it. They're not destroying it. They're suppressing it. Well, it takes an activity to suppress something. You suppress something only if it's there. If you stand down on a spring, uh, you're suppressing the spring's natural ability to spring up. And once you take your hand away, the thing will spring up. We, we forget that. We, we tend to judge statically instead of dynamically. For instance, the Catholic doctrine of Christ's real presence in the Eucharist is that he's hiding there. That's an action. He's doing something. He's not just there. He's, he's playing a game, a very serious game, hiding. Come and, come and get me. So, so here, too, the, the act of suppressing is an action. And once you stop doing it, the Tao will, will spring up and enlighten your conscience. So uh, long range, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic. Short range, it looks pretty bad. We're going down and down. But if you look at our one most divinely revealed guide to human history, namely the history of, of uh, Israel, in the Old Testament, you find it's like a roller coaster. For every rise is a fall, for every fall there's a rise. And we're certainly on, on the fall side right now. But if there's not a rise after this fall, then this is the end. This is the great tribulation. And it hasn't gotten that bad yet. Jesus describes it this way. The times are going to be so bad that if the times were not shortened, no one could ever be saved. I think we're still a, a good distance from that fall. So I, I have hope. Thank you. I'm not an optimist. I'm a pessimist by, by nature, but I'm an optimist by conviction. Dr. Crave, thank you so much. Um, what I wanted to ask you to do is expand a little bit on the comment you made when you were drawing the egg analogy, that um, an egg, which just continues to be an egg, must go bad um, or hatch. And that you, you threw off the comment that a death is the hatching. Um, mm -hmm. It seems that death is the, like, as the consequence of the fall is not a good thing, but the hatching of an egg is a good thing. So can you help mm -hmm. draw out the parallels between those? A little bit further. God is so clever that he takes evil and uses it for good. The most spectacular example of that is the worst moral evil that was ever uh, committed, namely the deliberate torture and murder of God incarnate. And Christianity says that's our only hope of heaven. Thus Augustine says, oh, happy fault, oh, fortunate fault, brought about such a great redemption. So once we fall, God doesn't just give up and doesn't just slap us in the face and doesn't just lecture us. He uses our very mistakes to reverse us. All things work together for good for those who love God. All things, even bad things, if we let him. That's a radical optimism. Uh, Dr. Kraft, um, my name is Helena. You mentioned um, a couple questions ago that you thought we were in a short-term kind of downfall, but long-term, um, maybe things would get better. I don't know if you have any insight, um, but if you do, what do you see maybe that could, will, will be that thing? Like, cause I, I think personally, I feel like I see a lot of um, not just the bad, but the self-perpetuating bad that is kind of gaining traction as it goes, kind of snowballing more and more. And I guess um, one of the questions I ask myself a lot is like, what, what is strong enough to stop the, the negative forces, I think. Well, let me say two things. The first thing is by far the most important. Number one, neither you nor I have any answer to that question because we don't have crystal ball. History is not determined. It's, it's dependent on our free choices. Unpredictable. Secondly, I think most likely that we're going to continue to slide down much farther 
until we we get to that point where we, we can't ignore our mistakes. And that might be a, a, a global nuclear war. Uh, If we're so miserable and so unhappy that we can't not know that our experiment with moral relativism and uh, idolization of our technology uh, uh, has made us uh, miserable, uh, if we reach that point, uh, we have to turn around. We have to learn from our uh, it, It's like they say in, in AA, you have to hit bottom before you can uh, up and we haven't by any means hit bottom yet. Our lives are still fairly comfortable. So I'm, as I said, I'm, I'm a pessimist about the short run, which may be a matter of centuries. Thank you. In fact, people ask me why I have a smile on my face if I think that the world is so crazy. And my answer is, hey, I'm 85 years old. I'm getting out of this insane asylum pretty soon. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for speaking. I'm Ryan Hurley from Iowa State University. And something that I see is a lot of people seem to replace. And, you know, we talked about happiness. So I'm just using it as a general term, but they seem to replace happiness with dopamine. You know, people like their photos online and it gives them a little rush. And I wonder, will that slow down people realizing how bad it is? And if so, when do you think that will break? When do you think it won't be enough to get likes on photos and things to that effect? First of all, that's not new. We're pleasure addicts. We're shallow. We're stupid. We're fallen. Uh, technology gives us many more opportunities for that, but it doesn't force us to use them. Second, I have no crystal ball. I don't know how or whether or when uh, the thing will happen. Uh, what you get in the biblical prophets is not a timetable, uh, but a map. There is where this road leads. This road leads down, that road leads up. Uh, you don't get predictions about how long it'll take. Hi, I'm Alex Davies. I actually go to Boston College. I'm the only one here. I've heard of it. Me, but... I've heard of it. It's a pretty good place. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I guess my question is, I'm a senior, so I'm about to graduate next year. Um, I'm actually a communication major. And my question to you is, I'm trying to word this in the most delicate way possible. How do you fight um, and win the war on woke ideology at a place like Boston College that is a Jesuit institution that is just getting more woke by the year um, how do you fight that and how do you win the battle? Because it's a very difficult one. Um, I imagine in Texas, it's less of a battle, but at a place like Boston College, it's a, it's a battle that um, often I think people who fight the woke narrative and the woke ideology um, often feel like they're, they're in, in an um, uphill battle with no, um, no real way to win in a way other than to submit to the the wokesters. Um, and it's like you said earlier in your talk, like you genuinely can get fired from your job if you try to oppose these narratives. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, this is not just a question of like whether or not uh, you agree with uh, the narrative. It's actually a question of whether or not you want to survive in, in our societies mm -hmm. and thrive in the corporate world. So I was just wondering what your perspective is as someone who's from Boston College and how you see that? I'm not going to answer that question. I'm going to ask a better question. Go ask what's my perspective. I'm going to answer what's God's perspective. What did he say to us? If, if you're a Christian, what's going to happen to you? Well, in the world, they will hate you. If you have no battles to fight, if you have no wars to endure, if you have no sacrifices to make, you're not close enough to him. We are not commanded to win to fight. We're, we're so obsessed with winning that we don't fight very well. Uh, one of the things that made uh, a lot of Japanese soldiers formidable in hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat in World War II uh, was that they, uh, they had no 
demand to, to win. Uh, the kamikaze pilots were. Uh, they weren't going to win. They were going to lose. They were going to lose their life. But they were going to obey. Uh, the opposite extreme, Gandhi makes a point, of, uh, and he gets it from the Bhagavad Gita, uh, the, the duty that you have as a warrior is not to win, right? If you think that winning is everything, then 50% of the time you're gonna be a failure. But if your commanding officer, God, tells you not to win, and never, 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 never give up. There are absolutes. And you never compromise on love and you never compromise on truth, no matter what the cost. And maybe the cost will be light and maybe the cost will be heavy, but that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether you win, except in your own soul. It matters whether you fight. Mother Teresa said, God did not put me in this world to be successful. I'm here to be faithful. Thank you, Dr. Kraft. Um, so today in our world where we are using technology, um, there can be certain tasks such as um, find a, lo a location or like driving to a certain place where it's just easier to look up maybe on your map instead of like, let's say you're new somewhere you want, instead of just learning the area and driving around and finding anything, you could just look it up on your map. But in doing that, you aren't, if you are not, for example, learning the town, let's say you move to a new town, instead of learning the town, you're just using your map to find everything. You're not developing your intellect. And um, we live in a world where that's not always respected. So how do we get people to recognize there is goodness and not like always necess necessarily relying on technology to do the things that in the past we had to learn how to do? Well, that's a fairly easy question to answer. And the answer is basically try it, you'll like it. Try, uh, try biking to work instead of uh, carpooling. Uh, and try actually um, literally uh, smelling the roses, taking the time to do it. Uh, and uh, go and, and meet the other side. Uh, go uh, make some friends among the pool, the, the, the basket of deplorables. Uh, and uh, uh, don't prefer screens to nature. Uh, even though it takes more effort and maybe more money and more time to interact with the concrete thing than it does to push a couple of buttons on your computer, uh, try the concrete. You'll like it better than the abstract. Hi, Professor. Thank you for your talk. Uh, my name is Walker. I'm a junior. And I was wondering, you talked about how essentially we're becoming more like computers. And like computers at a fundamental level like execute a series of instructions. And I was wondering, are you sure you've seen like generations of students come through? And if you had any comments or observations about like that specifically about sort of students in 1980 versus now, are we more just like trying to check boxes, complete instructions to get mm -hmm. to some nebulous good? We talk a lot about creativity and creative thinking and critical thinking, but I think we're doing less of it. I think students are just as intelligent as they used to be, but their intelligence is more like computer intelligence. They want a formula. They want a one-to-one uh, -one relationship. They're very good at imitating formulas, even, even for writing. Uh, Stephen King, for instance, is a very good writer and has an excellent formula. And it's very difficult for him to write a, a, a really bad and unsuccessful book, but it's a formula, it's predictable. But students who are truly creative are not going to follow the formula as you follow the, the structure and function of a machine that's, that's not able to interact with you as an unbreakable human being, but is a, a totally predictable machine. The more you treat the world as a machine, the more power you have over it and the less happiness you have over it. The more you let it surprise you, and be creative with you. And the more creative you are with it and the more chances you take with it, uh, the more exciting and happier it is. And computers, computers, to my mind, do not need that. Maybe, maybe there's a way of, of, of enlisting them in, in, in that higher goal, but they tend to, to take over instead of being humble servants. Hi, Dr. Kreef, thank you for your talk. Um, I'm Connor Omar, I'm from Baylor University, and I have a bit of a pragmatic question when it comes to detachment. 
Uh, so when it comes to more dangerous forms of technology like contraception and things of that sort, um, what role should the state have in helping people to detach? Like, do we experience a, a truer sense of detachment when we as individuals of our own volition decide that we're not going to use those things even though it's a, an option that is free to us? Or uh, when is it better for the state to get involved and limit those things? I don't think there's any one answer to that question because there are two very different cultural situations that we find ourselves in. In the Middle Ages, we had a culture that was massively Christian, uh, had its problems, its spiritual problems, as well as its non-spiritual problems. But the expectation was that the state was on your side and state-sponsored stuff was going to be done in the name of God. Maybe that name was misused and maybe it was hypocritical, but it was a, an overall feeling of comfort and security and boundaries and here they were. And if somebody fundamentally uh, crashed those boundaries and those values and those laws, uh, the whole society would be against them. We are now living in the opposite kind of society in which the cultural expectation is, if not anti-Christian, at least secular. And Christians have to fight as they did in the catacomb. Uh, you have to be countercultural to survive. So I think there's two very different answers to that question uh, in those two different situations. And there's a, a, a middle position uh, sort of uh, identified with the enlightenment, namely, uh, faith that human nature and human reason could be an adequate substitute for God and genuine religion in guiding human behavior. Well, that was a mistake, but it wasn't as big a mistake as postmodernism, which gives up even on human nature and human reason. Uh, so if you're in that middle situation, as we used to be until the 60s, if you wanted to put a, a date to it, uh, if you're in that middle situation, you can still appeal to reason and natural law. Uh, you can't do that anymore. In fact, I find that uh, uh, the woke people are much more threatened by philosophical arguments than by religious arguments. They dismiss religion as, well, we'll tolerate that. You can do anything you want. You can believe anything you want, but you can't think anything you want. We have control of, uh, uh, of everything outside of religion. Uh, and, and we're not threatened by your private religion as long as it doesn't become public. So we're in a, a, a much more countercultural situation indeed than, than we ever were. We're, we're turning the clock back about uh, 1800 years. We're not yet uh, literally persecuted. They're not crucifying Christians. Uh, but uh, if you're not forced to make some sort of sacrifice, at least lose some friends, uh, you're not really doing much of an important work. You're, uh, the closer you get to the cross, the more splinters you get. Now, I'm at Boston College, which is still at least barely Catholic. That's what BC means. So it's pretty comfortable. Uh, if I was at a state university, I probably would have lost my job by now, unless I would have compromised my conscience. Uh, for uh, uh, if a transgender student demands that uh, he be addressed by she pronouns and the professor deliberately refuses, that professor can lose his job. That's not so at, at BC, at least not yet. BC is, is at least significantly Catholic. If you want to get a good education, a good Catholic education at BC, you can. I mean, it's not the University of Dallas uh, or Thomas Aquinas College. But there are elements in it that are like that. So it's a comfortable place, doubly comfortable. I mean, it's Catholic enough to feel like home and it's pagan enough to be a mission field. So you're not talking to a martyr here. You're talking to, to somebody uh, who has a large comfort zone. Talk to a martyr, you'll get a better answer. Especially the philosophy department, we're very, very um i graduated from bc so there's not there might not be another time where i can ask you a question per se but i'm wondering what your thoughts are one of our earlier speakers talked about what an education and courage would look like the virtue of courage has been perhaps 
like degraded or is severely lacking in our society compared to say the time of our founding fathers who pledged to each other their lives their fortune and their their lives their honor what is it lives fortune and sacred honor sacred honor yeah yeah i mean that's a that's a pure act of courage and it's to be afraid of what's going to happen in the future what could happen and then doing it anyways because you recognize that your cause is mm -hmm. just and i think you've talked a lot about the need for us to be courageous today in our sordid backward world and i'm wondering what your thoughts are on how technology the actual apparatus of social media and various various medical technologies has changed our ability to cultivate vir the virtue of courage i don't think it has it's threatened it but there's always threats I don't see technology as changing the situation where courage is an unpopular and difficult virtue, but it's absolutely necessary virtue. Uh, since our human nature is fallen, since we are now instinctively selfish, uh, we have to act contrary to our nature uh, courageously with some sort of self-sacrifice to practice any virtue at all. That's not new. What's new is that we don't have heroes anymore. That's what Solzhenitsyn said in his great 1978 Harvard commencement address. Uh, he said, in effect, uh, uh, you know, we Russians are, are, are wicked and corrupt, and I'm certainly not rec uh, recommending our system. But I come here, and I, I notice that uh, there's something missing, courage. Life is so easy here, so comfortable. Uh, which is why there are so many great Russian novels and so few great American novels. Uh, diamonds come about under great geologic pressure. We haven't produced many diamonds because we don't have as much pressure. In poor and difficult places, you have, you have martyrs, you have heroes. We still have heroes in our fairy tales, in our epics, which is why The Lord of the Rings is so popular. We've got genuine heroes in it. And we still, uh, hopefully, tell those fairy tales to our small children. But once they get into the, the public educational system, uh, they are told, you must not make such judgments. You must not uh, even distinguish the hero and the villain. Uh, I think public education is the first institution that is going to be spectacularly doomed. Uh, it's, in a sense, the most important uh, a great book by Charles Malik, one of the great Christians of the 20th century. He was the president of Lebanon. He was the secretary general of the United Nations, and it was the main mind behind the best thing the United Nations ever did, namely the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Charles Malik. It's called Christ and the University. And he points out that the university is the most powerful institution in the world today because everyone who gets a position of power uh, passes through the university. Uh, and our universities are much more, how do I put it, woke, much more, quote, progressive, progressive tooth decay than the rest of, of society. Uh, Ramsky, the most intelligent communist philosopher of the 20th century, uh, famously said, communism will not win the world at the ballot box, and it will not win the world on the battlefield. It will win the world in the classroom. So here we are, so-called intellectuals, academics, uh, we're at the heart of the battlefield. I congratulate you not only on having excellent questions, uh, but on, on being here. Uh, and we don't need to give a plug to ISI because you're all ISI people, but I'm very grateful for your existence.